Welcome to this presentation on sustainable software engineering. And if you've never heard of sustainable software engineering, that's fine, not many people have. It's a very, very new discipline. And this lecture is, is gonna give you kind of a really good overview of what it means and, and kind of what it entails. My name is Asim Hussein. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as Joake. In fact, you can find me as Joake pretty much on every single platform out there. My blog is asim.dev, my website is asim.dev, and I'm what's called a green cloud advocacy lead at Microsoft, or even the green developer relations lead at Microsoft. Um, that's kind of my, my role. I'm gonna hopefully explain what that means and kind of what that, what that entails as well during this uh, presentation. But first, picture my son. This is my son, Micah. There's something about this picture that makes me think he loves his daddy. Now, uh, before he was born, a friend of mine, he's about two years old now, before he was born, a friend of mine gave me some, some great advice, which was, ask him, take the nappy changes. Take the nappy changes. My wife was breastfeeding, or planning to breastfeed, and he said, well, she's gonna have that quality time with him breastfeeding. All the relatives and friends are gonna be over, so they're gonna be kind of playing with him and holding him, and you, you're not gonna have that quality time with your son to offer to take the nappy changes. I thought it was great advice. Um, and so I took the advice and I took, I took the nappy changes. And I told my wife, I said, I said to my wife, actually, I'll take the nappy changes. She was, she was very, very happy about this fact that everything was great. But then a few days later, she turned around and she said, actually, I've decided we're going to use cloth nappies, not disposable nappies, cloth nappies. Now we're pretty, we thought we were a pretty green family. We, we recycled, we did a few other things, not much else, but we did what we thought you had to do. Now I realize it's very, we need to do so much, so much more. But we thought we, we did what we needed to do and we thought cloth nappies was kind of a, a good step in the right direction. And it, and it is, and it is. Um, but the thing to understand about cloth nappies, a disposable nappy, you just poop in a nappy and you throw it away. And a cloth nappy these days, if you've never seen one before, they're actually a lot more advanced than, you want, than what you might imagine. They're not just a piece of cloth, they kind of and have an elastic band, they have bamboo inserts, but you do have to deal with poop quite a lot. You have to get, and you get very, very used. He poops eight times a day. You get very, very used to dealing with poop. And you, I don't, I'm not bothered about poop at all in the slightest now. I've been meeting sometimes I mean, Teams meetings or video conferences and people will be like, ask him, ask him, what's that on your, on your face? And he'll be like, don't worry about it. It's just poop. I get very, very used to dealing with poop. But then I had an epiphany um, a few months after he was born and I realized kind of how come I was happy to deal with poop eight times a day for the environment and yet, and yet I'd never ever asked once in any technical meeting, in any scrum meeting, in any architectural discussion, any tech meeting of any nature at all, I had never held up my hand and asked, well, what's the greener solution? I was willing to deal with poop eight times a day, but I, in my work and in my industry, I had never once asked the question, well, how can I do my job greener? And that led me on a, on a long, long journey, which eventually means I start my full-time job at Microsoft uh, to both figure out how to build green applications in the cloud, and also even just figure out what does it even mean to be a green application, because it turns out not everybody agrees. Um, but I'm gonna talk, what I'm gonna talk today, I'm gonna talk, talk about the whole journey and kind of take you through um, my journey and how I figured out how to build uh, green applications and, and kind of what I figured out along the way, kind of one of the really important things you need to know if you want to have a good impact when building green applications. So that's kind of what this, this is gonna give you that, the, the big lecture, the big overview of that. Now, when I first kind of realized wanted to, to look into this space, um, I asked around, I asked friends of mine, one of my friends um, was in the Green Party in the UK and I reached out and I said, look, I need to know, where can I find out this information? And they suggested something, they suggest join the community climateaction.tech and I joined that community. Now I'm a co-organizer of Climate Action Tech where I believe one of the largest tech communities in the world that focuses on, 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 on climate. And inside there, you'll just find 
There's we have a, we're a few thousand people right now, and you're going to find experts in pretty much any area. We're going to be in Climate Action Tech. We're a Slack group, and you can ask any questions inside there. It's a very vibrant Slack group. You always get answers. Um, so I really recommend you, you, you go join that. But I, I went and joined that. And inside there, I, I got some great advice and I made some great friends. And through that, we started to... They, start, they, they taught me a lot of things, to be honest with you. But a lot of the stuff I learned still is in kind of academic papers or in lots of different books out there. So what I realized we needed to do is we need to get it... Get the knowledge really condensed down into, into a, a, a core set of what I realized were, were principles... Because it's not about knowing how to do something. It's about that's not where we are right now. We need to need to know how the world works. That's where we are. Like you, we, we need to figure out kind of what are the what are the principles. What are what are what are the things you need to know so you can make good decisions. That's where we are. I can't just tell you to make these decisions because it depends one thousand percent on on what it is that you're doing. But if you have the underlying knowledge. You can then make the, the hopefully the right decisions for yourself, and kind of this is a growing field. And if you make the right decisions, write about it, talk to me about it, let let's publicize it. But anyway, the, we we created what's called the principles of sustainable software engineering. If you go to the website principles.green, you will find it. And these are eight core principles that you need to know. Principles that you need to know, and if you know these principles you will then be able to build, I believe, build green applications or have an effective impact upon the carbon emissions of your applications. Now, I didn't come up with the name Sustainable Software Engineering. I believe it came up uh, in various meetings by the Mozilla Foundation, but I would argue that I'm the first person to kind of get it all down into, into kind of an easy to understand kind of website and kind of really get some structure around it. And I argue sustainable software engineering is an emerging discipline at the intersection of climate science, software, hardware, electricity markets, and kind of data center design. It's a much broader level of knowledge than you maybe are used to when you're working with um, uh, other systems, like just narrow fields of, 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 of software. You have to understand much broader depth. So let's go through. I'm going to go through through them. Hopefully, in in in, in quite quite fast speed. I'm going to go through all eight of all all eight of them. Hopefully, let's see where we get to. So the first one is carbon. So um, my first problem was I realized that when I said green, it means different things to different people. Okay, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It means different things to different people. So let's get on the same page. Let's all be aligned regarding what does green mean. Okay, what does sustainable mean? What does what does the word sustainable in software engineering? What does that mean? What's our goal? And the goal is carbon. So what do I mean by carbon? Well, I'm talking about, I'm talking about greenhouse gases. So greenhouse gases act, are acting as a as a as a blanket warming up the planet. Um, they're a natural phenomenon. Um, that's a really important thing to understand because that's a common attack that comes back to. It's a natural phenomenon. I 100% natural. The, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase and decrease slowly over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And that results in temperature increasing and decreasing th over thousands and thousands of years. What's happening now is because of human activity, because of human activity, the amount of greenhouse gases has shot up in the atmosphere and it's shot up too fast to adapt to, adapt to. Okay, we can adapt to anything, but when things happen too fast, we don't have time to adapt, and that's when lots of terrible things happen. Animals can't adapt, so they can become extinct, and even humanity, I mean, we can't really move cities like that, right? Okay, and there's mill billions of people living on this planet, so how can we, ad our ability to adapt, we don't think we can, um, and that's the problem. Not the fact that it's happening, but it's happening too fast. Um, that's much more complex than that, but that's the core story, okay? Um, so there's many different types of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. All of them have a warming effect on the Earth. The most common is carbon dioxide, but there's many, many others. For instance, methane is another common one, and it has a much greater warming potential than carbon. It between like 20 to 80 times, because uh, it decreases over time, the warming effects of, of carbon. But it gets really, really complicated if when you're talking about greenhouse 
gases, if you had to med talk about each and every single one, so we normalize everything into what's called carbon dioxide equivalent. So when we talk about one ton of methane, I'll actually, I'll actually describe one ton of methane as, as, let's say, 80 tons of carbon, or 80 tons of carbon equivalent. So we normalize everything into carbon. It's not the only greenhouse gas, but we normalize everything into carbon. And that's we also then just shorten it into carbon. So that's, that's why we call it just carbon. When, when we say carbon, we, we mean all of the greenhouse gases. And so when I talk about this stuff, I'm talking about being carbon efficient. Which really, really, the opposite, the, to explain efficiency, let's talk about waste. Um, and I come from this a position, this is my position. There's many different positions, and again, sustainable software engineering takes a position. I come from a position where we're always going to be emitting carbon. We're always going to be emitting carbon. Um, I breathe, I emit carbon. Okay, so the goal, the, di the, the direction we have to face and the things we need to do is to become more efficient. Okay, our goal might be different. Our goal might be to have zero emissions or, or something along those lines. But the direction, the thing we need to do to get there is to always focus in on carbon efficiency. It's no point, it's no good just saying that's our goal, go do it, if we don't give people the direction they need to go in. So our direction that we always face as sustainable software engineers when we're looking at a solution and we're trying to figure out which is the solution we should choose, we choose a solution that is more carbon efficient. Um, which really means for every gram of carbon we emit, we're getting the most value out of it as possible. And I think when I, when I, when I talk about green, I, I, it's about efficiency all the time. Okay, when I talk about sustainability, it's about efficiency. Okay, that's where, that's where I think about it. I think a great example of this is petrol powered cars and, and electric vehicles. And I think let's just go through this example. When we take the black is petrol powered cars, let's look, let's, let's look at how wasteful it is. When we get the oil from the ground and we turn that crude oil into petrol, we lose 50, about 50% of the energy potential in that oil is just gone. It just disappears. Diesel is less so. Diesel, diesel we only lose about 40%. But petrol, we lose 50%. That thing, petrol weighs stuff, so we need to get that to a car. And then we lose kind of another 20% because it weighs, you know, we have to ship it around the world. It weighs stuff, so we lose that. But then an, an engine in a car, an internal combustion engine in a car, is only about 20% efficient at turning the petrol into forward motion, okay? So then we've got 8%. 8%. I don't think anybody should be proud of 8% efficiency. But anyway, that, that's, that's the efficiency we have with um, internal combustion engines. I'd argue, I would argue, if this thing was 10 times more efficient, we wouldn't be having the same problems we're having today. Okay, there's many, there's many arguments you can make that we still will, but if you think about it, if we're 10 times more efficient, would, would we be in the position we are in today? Maybe we'd just burn more petrol, I know that, but like, would we? Uh, so then the, let's, let, let's look at electric vehicles. So let's, when we talk, let's, let's say we got the energy from solar, solar panels. We consider that 100% efficient because that sunlight was gonna hit the earth anyway, and it's also free, right? So we take it, um, and once you paid for the solar panel, it's 100% free. So you get 100% of that solar energy we, we, we get. Taking that electricity to a car is very efficient. That's very conservative, 2% loss. Very conservative. It's getting that, that electricity to a car. And, and I, I might have the wrong number here, I apologize. Uh, an, a typical electric vehicle is about 60% efficient, 60 to 70% efficient at turning electricity into forward motion. So I think 75% is, is incorrect. Oh. So it's probably more like 70%. Okay, 8% and 70%. That's what we're talking about. When we're talking about being green, we're just talking about being efficient. We're just talking about not wasting, right? That's our world. Um, and so we're just talking about being carbon efficient. Okay, you give, we're emitting some carbon to implement this, this functionality. Let's, let's make the most value out of it as possible. If you show me a developer that doesn't care about efficiency, I'll show you a developer I, I will almost certainly never want to hire. I never want to work with. Okay, it's efficiency. We all care about efficiency. We always care about efficiency. But what are we optimizing for? Let's optimize for carbon. Um, so that's kind of why the first principle of sustainable software engineering is to build applications that are carbon efficient. This is the most important one. If you're faced with a decision, you're going to pick the one that is the more carbon efficient because that gets us to our goal. The second principle is electricity. 
So when I think of electricity, I think of electricity as, as, as clean, or I used to think of electricity as clean. When I, when I plug uh, something into a, the wall socket, I think of it as green. Um, there's, my hands don't get dirty, there's no smell. Um, it's clean, right? But the reality is electricity is, is, is one of the most dirtiest things on the planet. That's because, that's because most electricity is still created through the burning of fossil fuels. Not in France. France is very, very good. Most electricity is still created, I believe, created through, through nuclear power, but it's still low carbon. Um, but for, generally throughout the world, about 80% of electricity is created through the burning of, of, of fossil fuels, na namely coal. Um, and it's responsible for ab about half, a um, little bit less than half of all the, all the carbon pollution in, in the world. Well, it depends country by country, but it's, it's kind of around there. Um, so now you, your brains are probably working. You're probably thinking, well, actually, how can I, um, I, I, my, 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 my software consumes electricity. I'll just rewrite everything in C or, or, or Rust or something along those lines. Before you go that direction, there's many other lower hanging fruit that you can take into account. But yes, that's the that's, that's generally the, the kind of right direction to, to, to at least be thinking in. But now we need to get, get clear. Now we need to understand electricity. I believe electricity should be literacy. I believe electricity should be taught as module one in any computer science course or degree or something like that. How could I have reached this advanced stage in my career without really understanding the thing that fuels all of my computing? It's incredible. I think it's shocking that I, I didn't know how electricity works. Nothing I do works without electricity. How can I not know how it works? Anyway, I've, I, I now really am researching a lot about electricity. It's actually quite, quite a very fascinating space, I think. Um, but let's talk about what you need to know in order to understand about electricity. The first one, what is a, what is a metric? Now, the metric we're gonna talk about a lot in this thing is, is kilowatt hour. And this is a measure of a volume of energy. A volume of energy is kilowatt hour. A kilowatt is a flow of energy. So a kilowatt is, is and in fact a watt is a flow of energy. A watt is a, a joule. A joule is the scientific unit and it means a volume of, of energy. A watt means one joule per second, it's a flow. A kilowatt means 1,000 joules per second. And a kilowatt hour means, what if you left that on for an hour? What is the volume of electricity you would get at the end of all of that? That's kilowatt hour, and that's a common term that you will use um, or you'll hear when talking about it. So it's very important to distinguish between whether you're hearing kilowatt, which is a rate, and kilowatt hour, which is a volume. But let's, before we go too much deeper, let's, let's talk for a second because I've just made you really upset about electricity, okay? Electricity this, is this huge part of the problem of, of the emissions in our world right now, okay? And you might think, oh God, electricity is so awful, but also electricity is a huge part of the solution. Everybody's so excited about electricity as the solution. And that's because, let's, let's have a look at how much energy, this is, this is energy I'm talking about. I'm gonna give you some numbers now and they're gonna be general energy numbers, not just electricity. But let's look at how much energy the world consumes um, how much power, I should say, the world consumes. So it's 18 terawatts. Remember, terawatt is a rate per second, okay? So 18 terawatts is the world consumption. So all the damage that we're doing to the world right now, all the harm that we're causing, all the emissions that we're pumping out, they're to get 18 terawatts of energy. That includes kind of burning petrol and, and electricity, everything. Let's have a look at, and but there's 1,000 terawatts available from wind. Okay, and a lot of that's offshore wind, offshore wind, things you don't see with your eyes. Kind of offshore wind is where everybody's getting very, very excited about because no one wants a wind farm next to their house, but who cares if there's a wind farm far away and see somewhere, okay? And admittedly, to get that 1,000 terawatts, you have to trap every single gust of wind on the planet, but there's 1,000 terawatts available. A lot more than we consume, a lot more than we consume is available through wind. But the crazy thing is how much is available through, through solar. 173,000 terawatts is available through solar. Now, admittedly, you'd have to have a solar panel the size of the Earth to get 1,700. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, we have 10,000 times more energy available to us via solar than the world is consuming right now. Electricity is a big part of the problem. Electricity is a huge part of the solution, 
okay? It's a huge part of the solution, okay? So don't get all upset about electricity. Electricity is fantastic. We need to electrify everything. And if we do that, it doesn't, it's not everything. It really isn't everything, but it's one of the quickest things that we can do right now to have an impact in the next 10, 20 years. Um, but really, that's why the second principle of sustainable software engineering is to build applications that are energy efficient. Okay, they're energy efficient. Typically, we don't typically look at that unless you're building a mobile application. We don't typically look at that. But that's our goal is to build applications that are energy efficient because electricity, you can you can draw a line from electricity to carbon. And since our goal is to become carbon efficient, our goal is to become electricity efficient. That's, some, that's the way you need to think about things as well. Can you draw a line from this resource that you are consuming to carbon? If you can, then that resource is a proxy for carbon and you need to be, be, be very efficient with it. Um, I listen to this podcast. I really recommend you listen to this podcast called The Energy Transition Show. Um, it's one of the few podcasts I listen in the, in the, in the sustainability climate space that, that really gives me a lot of hope. Um, and it's not really about sustainability. It's about energy. And it's really about talking about that there is a transition happening. There's a transition happening from fossil fuel powered to renewable or low carbon powered energy. It's happening. The only question is, is it going to happen slow or fast? There's going to be a huge amount of money that's about to be made, um, depending on which side of the of that fence you, you you land at. There's some company, you know, and I think that's kind of that's kind of what this this podcast really um, gets me excited about. Okay, that 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 you know there is a solution here if we accelerate this transition. There's something that can help us get to um, meeting kind of our, our targets if we accelerate this transition. And it taught me, but it taught me many things. It taught me one thing. It taught me was about carbon intensity, and that's a not, and that's this idea that not all electricity is born the same way. Okay, some electricity is created through the burning of fossil fuels, and some electricity, as we just described, is created through the burning through through renewable sources or low carbon means. And there's this measure of carbon intensity which tells you how how dirty or clean is your electricity, and it's grams of carbon dioxide. Per kilowatt hour. Now we understand why I was explaining all these terms before. Okay, we have to understand this. Grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour. The global average in 2019 was 519 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. France is regularly under 100 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. Um, plenty of other places in, in, in the world are, are above kind of 1,000 grams a kilo per kilowatt hour. Um, but that's that's how dirty and clean your electricity is, um, and there's a great company called one. Uh, well, it's called Tomorrow, but they have a product called Electricity Map, um, and I just took a video of myself using it. So you, can, if you go to Electricity Map, you can hover over different grids, different electricity grids in the world, and you can see it's telling you what is the carbon intensity. Why is it not given France? That's interesting. What is the carbon intensity of um, of the electricity? And you can see in some countries are much much worse than others. Um, and that's because some countries just have more renewables than others. Some countries like Australia famously burns a lot of uh, coal. India famously burns a lot of coal. America famously burns a lot of coal. Um, and other countries kind of famously use a lot of renewables. So, because they just have more, more wind farms and more solar power plants in, that, in those regions. So by different regions, the electricity is different for different regions. But also the carbon... In, or so I should say the carbon intensity is different for different regions because different regions have different kind of energy sources. But it also changes over time because let's imagine this scenario here. Um, uh, we're in a region, okay, and uh, everybody's using a certain amount of electricity. There's no storage in the system, not really. There's, no, no, there's a few batteries, but tiny percentage. What happens is, is if you turn on your TV the utility plant has to kind of create electricity to match exactly what you're consuming. That's how all the utilities in the world work. So if there's a lot of solar and wind right now, a lot of electricity is coming from solar and wind. Um, and then it's only, and then the utilities go, well, we'll only bur burn a little bit of coal and gas to kind of meet the rest of electricity. So therefore the carbon intensity is quite low. But then the wind and solar kind of goes down, the, the, the variable sources of, of electricity. So what then happens is that utilities go, oh God, we need to get more electricity. Well, let's, let's burn more coal and, and burn more gas right now. And then they, the carbon intensity increases. So over time, the carbon intensity increases and decreases. Okay. 
person I probably thinking that well I can probably build applications or maybe I'll choose a region if I have a choice of the region maybe I'll pick the region with the averagely the, the best uh, carbon intensity um, or if you want to be more uh, 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 you know, real time about it you can you can get feeds that give you uh, real-time data about the carbon intensity. So one of them is carbon intensity at UK. If you're in the UK, this is a completely free resource, completely free. Uh, you don't even need to have a, 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 a username or a login or anything like that. It's a free API. Um, you can hear and it gives you the, the, the real-time carbon intensity of the UK grid. What time is a uh, US non-profit? And they tend to have better data for the US stuff. And electricity map, I showed you just before, this is uh, more European companies, tomorrow's European startup. Uh, French slash, uh, I believe they're based in France actually now that I think about it. I believe they're a French startup um, called Tomorrow. It might be Danish, I'm not 100%. Um, and they have their, their, their product called Electricity Map as well. And they have better data, I would argue, for, 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 for Europe. They, they have, all of them have data for, every, well, what time Electricity Map, electric map have data for all the whole world as well. Um, so this is why, these are the sources you can go to to get that carbon intensity data in real time. And then you can make decisions about where you run stuff, which has the list, so it has less, uses the less carbon intensity. That's the third principle. Consume electricity with the lowest carbon intensity. I think I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to jump through the next two as fast as possible. So I remember, this is actually me speaking at a conference, I think it was in Poland. I think it was in Poland. Yeah, this is me in Poland. And you can see from the slide at the front, I was definitely giving a talk on, on climate change. <laughs> Not this talk, a slightly different talk. Um, and you know, are you... Oh, just, just to bring everybody up to speed, we used to speak in person. We used to go to these things called conferences and used to go in person. And I used to stand on a stage and give this presentation. And like, ask your parents. Um, but anyway, what you, what would happen uh, after one of these? After I give a presentation, every time I give a presentation, we finish the the talk and I stand to the side. And there's usually I get a number of people coming up to me asking me questions. Um, maybe I get questions virtually with this one. And I remember this was so, was so funny because this guy kind of had been waiting in the back of the queue. He's had a lot of questions. The guy waiting in the back of the queue eventually got to the front of the queue to speak to me and just said, um, you know, it was a great, great, great presentation style. Great presentation style. Love your presentation style. Uh, but you used a laptop, so I can't believe anything you said. And I really got confused because I thought it was really strange. I didn't understand what he was talking about. What it boils down to is that is that is that because I used a laptop and a laptop when it was created kind of a released emissions, how dare I talk about the climate? Which is, is kind of one of these what about is a It's a really dumb argument. Um, and I get it all the time. Um, but what the the and, and I th I think I think it's hilarious that this guy like sat in the audience throughout the entire talk, didn't walk out, but sat in the audience angry what I was doing, came down and queued up for a long time to come speak to me to say he didn't believe a word I said and then walked off. I thought it's funny. Um, so I, use, I thought it was a great, great, great example of this. So, it, it, and what he's describing is this concept called embodied carbon, which is absolutely 100% true. Everything releases carbon. When he created this, headphones release carbon to create it. Um, you know, all kind of, and, and people measure this. We measure this. We know what this is. Okay, there's there's an entire field of study which just sits down and measures the carbon cost of everything, including MacBooks, okay, or, or laptops or, or Surface. We are our own team in Surface, which does it as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true that there's uh, and, and it's actually it's, it's oftentimes quite high as well, and it depends on what it is. An electric vehicle has an embodied carbon cost that is about equivalent to about four years of usage. So after four, four, five years, I think of usage. So after five years, it's paid off that carbon cost, and then it's kind of like carbon free. Um, that's the way to think about it. So, and the same thing happens with servers. The same thing happens with servers. They have a carbon cost, and it's and it's quite high. It's often quite high. This is just an example. But let's take take an example that a server had created, released four tons of carbon in its creation. Um, how do you think about that? Well, do you, you amortize that over a number of years. You say, like, well, server usually, maybe the lifetime is about four years. 
and you spread it, then you say, well, actually, it's about one ton a year. And then you can kind of like think about it as a continuous amount that you're releasing rather than a, a sunk cost that you've already spent. That's not the good way to think about embodied carbon. Spread it out across the lifetime of the product. As a great example, is, is if you look at the uh, a specific server, like the R R640 Dell server, they've re they release numbers. Um, the embodied carbon is 1.2 tons. Uh, one, yeah. And if you assume a four-year lifespan, you, 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 that's 320 kilograms a year. If you choose a European energy mix, I chose a European energy mix, which is quite clean. Um, it's 486 kilograms a year, if it's kind of maxed out, a, a max utilization. And so the yearly total is 806, and therefore about 40% of the yearly total is from the embodied carbon, okay? So it's quite a lot, right? We, we talked about electricity for ages, how making it energy efficient. There's almost nothing you can do, is there? If you made your application the most energy efficient you could possibly make it, it's still emitting carbon because the server emitted carbon. So then I kind of like thought, well, what, does that, what does that mean? What does that mean from a software engineering perspective? Because embodied carbon is kind of this 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 important thing to know, but so what? Like, what what as software engineers, what can we do about that? It's like it's, it's hardware; it's already been spent. And I think the way to think about it is, I think a good way to think about it is, um, uh, like the lifetime. Like we assumed the hardware would last four years, but actually, what if it lasts five years? Okay, why are we actually even getting rid of that server? Okay, sometimes, I mean, servers rarely like break down these days, There's no moving parts, like you're just making a decision to end of life something and bring something else back in. Um, from a cloud perspective, we're making very complex decisions like, well, this space in the in the data center costs money. At what point do we make less money from the hardware and kind of what point do we take it out? And, and it's not, we don't, Microsoft don't throw it away. We, we, we're now building these circularity centers. We kind of break them apart. We use them as spare parts. So we, 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 we resell them onto others. We don't, we don't throw, we try, we're going to move to a model. We're not throwing anything away. But essentially, we, we, th that, that's how to think about it from a software perspective. How do you make hardware last longer? How do you make it so that I don't have to buy a new mobile phone every three years because none of my old applications work on it? Um, And so if you think about it in that way, okay, if you then just say assume a five-year lifespan, you, you've dropped the um, the yearly total of the embodied carbon by, by, by 9%. Okay, so that's, a way, that's how you can have an impact on the embodied carbon. And really the way I describe this as is hardware, right? We just pointed out hardware has embodied carbon. So hardware is a proxy for carbon. So if we need to be carbon efficient, we need to be hardware efficient, okay? We need to efficiently use our hardware, okay? That's the way to think about it, efficiently use your hardware. And there's many things this could point to, many things this could point to, but one of them is, is just don't throw away hardware that is perfectly valid um, and, and needs to be used. Reuse it, recycle it, as many, always from a software perspective, Make it make it last longer. Make your applications run on older hardware. There's many 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 arguments you can put put to this. I'm gonna maybe just do the next one and then um, then then go go from there. So this is like a really interesting one called energy proportionality. Now to understand this, I had to really dig into the hardware aspect of servers. Um, and it's essentially about this, this this really interesting concept in hardware, which is the the more you use hardware, the better it becomes at turning electricity into useful operations, the more energy efficient it becomes, okay? The more you use hardware, the more energy efficient it becomes. It's a, it's, it's a really interesting aspect of hardware. Kind of what it boils down to is something along the lines of this, so utilization is kind of how you utilize a server is or, or even a, a computer. And at 0% utilization, you're still, this is just an example, you're still consuming power. Let's say this is an example, 100 watts. So even when your, your server is 100% idle, it's still consuming power. That's because there are so many things, parts of a server, which consume power regardless of your utilization. Your network card, doesn't matter if you're not utilized, or it's still consuming the same power. Memory, still consuming the same power, whether you're using it, whether it's full, whether you're not using it. 
Um, spinning disk hard drives, mm, yeah. Um, but also CPUs and GPUs, like per core, per core, there's a static amount of electricity that's always going to be used, whether it's 100% utilization or 0% utilization. So the more cores a CPU has, the more utilized it, uh, the, the less, um, the more static power draw there is. And what it also means is so that, so basically what this means is that, is that when you're not using a server very much, it's, it's still consuming electricity and it's, 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 this energy efficiency is really, really bad. And the more you use a server, the more energy efficient it becomes, okay? And what that kind of leads to is this argument that kind of, that kind of um, two servers at half utilization would be consuming 360, maybe 360 watts of electricity. Whereas the same work, if it was performed on one server, might be only consuming 200 watts of electricity. So this is kind of the, the, this idea of, of, of energy proportionality. So, and I, and I, I didn't understand this, any, anything about energy proportionality at all as a software engineer. Um, hardware people, people who design silicon, they very unwell understand this. People who design data centers and ops people who kind of really focus on, it, on data centers, they really understand this concept as well. And your average on-premise, so not hyper cloud like Microsoft, but your average private cloud, it's estimated that there's some good reports from, um, oh, I forgot the name of the organization, but there's some good reports, studies that show it's between 10 to 15% utilization. That's it. 10 to 15% utilization on average. Not Microsoft clouds, not hyperscale clouds, but your average private data centers. So as well as you're breaking the previous principle on, on embodied carbon, because you're not using hardware efficiently, right? You're also breaking the energy, you're also using, um, because of energy proportionality, the, the energy efficiency of your hardware is so much less because you're utilizing it very, very low. And that kind of leads to the next principle, which is uh, maximize the energy efficiency of hardware. Maximize the energy efficiency of hardware. And that requires kind of understanding a lot about the hardware because it doesn't actually change. But generally, it means utilizing it more means um, means uh, you're, you're using, you, you're, you're doing, you're being more energy efficient. But there actually are many more cleverer things you can do. that You can change the clock frequency. You can do a number of different things. But to do, to do these things, you have to understand hardware. And I spend a lot of my time now talking to people who design silicon on a day-to-day -day basis because that's where the efficiencies will come along. Um, I'm going to zoom through the rest of the networking is another one. Uh, networking is, is just servers, it's just computers, right? And so it consumes electricity, it has embodied carbon. There's many different carbon costs from networking. Um, but we think the uh, the... The, the, the two big ones are the amount of data and distance it has to travel, okay? So we know that we're very certain that if you send more data, it emits more carbon. And we're very certain if you send the same data over a longer distance, it emits more carbon. So with networking, reduce the amount of data and the distance it has to travel. From a web perspective, this would mean using edge nodes like CDNs. From a application development perspective, maybe it means building less chatty applications, doing a lot more processing on the database side and sending skinnier data down. There's many things this could mean, but essentially reduce the amount of networking. Demand shaping is really interesting, but it's, it's, I could do a whole session just on demand shaping, but essentially it's this idea, which is when you have a resource that's constrained, um, instead of trying to get more of the resource, demand less. Okay, demand less. So a great example of this is video conferencing software, I think. So with video conferencing software, when the bandwidth is reduced, the software just doesn't go, whatever, I still want to get my same frequency. I, I, still wanna, I still want my same resolution. I don't care, I don't care, I'll give you my same resolution. No, the software goes, oh, okay. Oh, the, um, you, you don't have enough bandwidth for me. Okay, I will reduce my demand. I will reduce my resolution. I will switch off video. I will, only, I will prioritize audio. Lots of things do this, okay? But we need to start doing this from a carbon perspective. So when the carbon cost of something is high, which we either know by measuring it directly or by lo looking at the, the proxy to something to carbon, then reduce our demand. Uh, I think a great example of this 
is perhaps um, one of the things we do know from a website is, or from networking again, is that if you are connecting in through a mobile network, like a mobile network, so a 3G, 4G, 5G, something like that, it's many, 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 many multiples of times more carbon inefficient than a Wi-Fi or a wired connection. Many, 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 many more times. So from, from a website or an application, if you know that your user is then connected through a mobile network, change the demand. Change the features of your application. I call it making it a carbon aware application. So you're changing the user behavior. Maybe you give the user an option. Do you want to go into eco mode? Um, do you want to make a voice? Do you want to make a video call? Do you want to make a voice call? Because the carbon is quite expensive right now. That's demand shaping. And what, what demand shaping is here all, also just to bring in user experience designers. This isn't this whole thing, soft, sustainable software engineering isn't just for software development, just for software engineers, just for people who write code. It's for everybody involved in the creation of software. So if you're a user experience designer, if you're a designer, can you design applications that demand shape, that are carbon aware? I think a really great example of this is a, is a um, I'm, I'm hopeful, hopeful I've got her name, like Yu Lin, or Yu Li. She uh, made uh, a, um, uh, she's a designer and she made a proposal for a carbon aware, carbon -aware operating system, system called Online, O-N. L I G N, you can Google it. Um, and she proposed many different features that an operating system could have where if the carbon was high, it would then pick lower lower carbon options and therefore demand shape. Um, I'm gonna zoom ahead. And the second is, is, op is optimization and, and measurement. Now I'd say here is is the really important thing about optimization, and I hope, yeah, is um, Again, we're building carbon air applications. It's very, very, very hard to measure carbon. So if you can proxy something back to carbon that is easy to measure, then use that as a measurement criteria. You can measure carbon, it's quite difficult. If you can, use that and just reduce, reduce as much as possible. As I said, electricity is a, is a proxy for carbon. It's oftentimes easier to measure. There's various tools out there. They're not that easy, but they're there that you can measure electricity consumptions of your applications. If you reduce electricity, you reduce carbon, so to use that cost at some level the cost uh carbon is factored into the cost of applications okay and so um reducing the cost of your application almost always reduces the carbon so yes yes carbon efficient green applications almost always cost less um networking so again we said mentioned before like reduce that's a proxy for carbon so reduce the amount of data and distance has to travel and then we know that reduces the carbon. Performance, you can always increase performance by throwing 50 more servers at the problem, but if you have the same compute and for the same compute you make your code more performant, um, then then that, we know that's a proxy for carbon and that reduces the carbon as well. And again, a lot of this stuff you'll be thinking, actually that makes my applications cheaper, faster, probably more resilient, yes, 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 yes. A green application is almost all of those things. Almost all of those things. Um, and that's why, um, yeah, optimization. Um, so there's a summary on you go to principles.green. You can find them all there. Um, you can apply. We're now working on trying to get get a lot more concrete information. Some of that's going to appear in principles.green. In fact, a lot of that's going to appear now on our website, docs.microsoft.com and Microsoft documentation. We're working through how to figure out how to do all, all the Microsoft products more how to all the services how to do how to do them more sustainably um and we also launched a blog called sustainable software engineering um and it's on microsoft and we're, 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 we're writing every single week people from all over microsoft um who've been working in this space this is a platform where we can basically talk about our stuff so you're gonna if you want to catch up and Stay up to date with kind of the latest stuff that we're working on, or people are thinking about, or you know, head to the SSE blog and, and you'll and you'll go there. Before I leave, I just want to say there's two, there's also two philosophies, and it's very, very important. There's two philosophies of sustainable software engineering as well. And the first one is that everybody has a part to play. Okay, everyone has a part to play. With sustainable software engineering, what we're figuring out, or we want to figure out, is what is the solution for everybody, whether you're a front-end engineer, a back-end engineer, a user experience designer, whatever your part to play, whoever, whoever you are, there's something for you to do. Everyone has a part to play, okay? This isn't just 
we're only going to focus in on database people because they, they, they cost the most carbon. No, everyone has a part to play in the solution. And the, and the second philosophy is that uh, carbon is enough to justify what we do. In the past, we always had to wrap sustainability in these little pills to make it easier for people to swallow. We were too like embarrassed. Like we, we knew if we said we were doing something because we've been green, no one would care. That's changed. That's completely changed. The existence of this conference means that that has changed. Okay. Now we do, if we are, if you're a sustainable software engineer, you are building your applications. You are doing it for the sake of sustainability and nothing else. That's why you're doing it. Yes. They're cheaper. Yes, they're more performant. Yes, they're more resilient. But those are added advantages. They're not the primary reason you're doing it. The primary reason we are doing this is for sustainability. The rest of these wonderful benefits we can use as arguments to help push our cause. But we're not. We're not saying we're doing it for to make applications cheaper. That's not our primary goal. Our primary goal is sustainability. Those are two philosophies. Thank you very much for your time.